Okay, so when you're thinking about 12 leads, and again, this should be a review for you, um, but just want to do a quick review of the anatomy of the coronary perfusion uh, of the heart there. And as you know, you have two major arteries that supply blood flow to the heart. You have your left anterior descending, they used to call that the widow maker because that's the one that's feeding the entire left side of the heart, at least the anterior and part of the inferior portion. If that goes, that's your left ventricle, they're in V-fib, they're in cardiac arrest. That's why they used to call it the widow maker when once upon a time men used to have more MIs than women, but as you know, that's evened out now that women have joined the workforce the same amount as men. So women and men are statistically around the same. So widow maker is actually a, a misnomer nowadays. It's an antiquated term. Um, if you notice, that left anterior descending kind of perfuses the in the anterior portion of the heart, it also perfuses the septal part of the heart. And it kind of comes down and perfuses sort of the what part, not all, but part of the inferior portion of the left ventricle. What you also notice, it branches off here in the left circumflex artery and perfuses the lateral part of the heart. And when you're thinking about lead groups and which coronary artery is, does it apply to, left-sided versus le right-sided heart failure, you have to think about which coronary artery is involved with this patient based on what I'm seeing. The right coronary artery is very interesting. Um, the right, and remember, we don't have right-sided 12 leads. It's really kind of geared towards the left side of the heart, the cameras, if you want to think of them as cameras. The right coronary artery perfuses, obviously, the right, right atrium and the right ventricle. But the interesting thing about it is it wraps around underneath and perfuses the inferior portion of the left ventricle. So I'll say that again. The right coronary artery wraps around and perfuses the inferior portion, the bottom part of the left ventricle. But remember, we don't have any right-sided leads, at least not initially. So how do we know if there's inferior MI that I'm looking at is coming from here or it's coming from here? And that is why nitroglycerin is contraindicated because we don't know until we move a lead and put a camera on the right side of the heart which we'll talk about in just a minute. Cool? Okay. Conduction system. Again, this is basic, basic stuff, stuff you should know, day one of paramedic school. We know that the SA node fires and it goes to the internodal junction and it goes to that AV node and then it branches off along the bundle branches here um, and then to the Purkinje fibers and contracts the heart. Um, the thing to think about as far as electrical conduction and a 12 lead is geographically where all these structures live. Where does the SA node live? The SA node lives right here in the right atrium. The conduction system, just like every other cell in our body, has its own blood supply. So back to that previous slide in right, uh, the various coronary arteries, which coronary artery is perfusing the SA node? Well, the right coronary artery, because it's on the right side. So when I start looking at an EKG and I start seeing things like bradycardias, blocks, second type 2, second degree uh, type 1, third degree heart blocks, and then I see a STEMI along with it, automatically, what do I think? Right coronary artery, right-sided heart failure. What vital signs go along with that? Well, bradycardia is your first clue. So as soon as you have a bradycardia STEMI patient, automatically you should be thinking right side of the heart versus left side. The second thing is, you think about it, if the right side is not pumping very well, it's not pumping much to the lungs, it's pumping even less to the left side of the heart, and then the left side doesn't have much to pump out. So if you think about blood pressure, is that patient gonna have a high blood pressure? Probably not. They're gonna have, they're gonna be hypotensive. So there's your clues, hypotension, bradycardia, Without even looking at the 12 lead, I'm already, and the patient's symptomatic, I'm already thinking right-sided heart failure. The third clue in that is when you take your lung sounds, right? You think, well, is this CHF, is this not? Well, if it's right-sided heart failure, the right's not pumping very well, not pumping much to the lungs, pumping even less to the left side, when I listen to my lung sounds, what's that gonna sound like? They're gonna be clear, right? Take that on the reverse side. What if it was a left coronary artery? What if it was something going on over here? Well, if the left side's getting backed up, 
Okay, well, where is it going to back up? It's going to back up to the lungs. So on a left-sided heart failure, you're going to have wet lungs. Those are your CHF patients. The CHF is sort of synonymous with left-sided heart failure. On a, um, in addition to that, vital sign-wise, hyper or hypo. Well, that's if everything's getting backed up and the pressure's building up, you're probably going to have a spike in blood pressure. Those patients also tend to be tachycardic. So if you think about your classic CHF patient who's tachycardic, maybe AFib-ish, um, with wet lung sounds, left-sided heart failure. Versus the right-sided guy, remember, the conduction system, bradycardia, hypotension. Okay, we haven't even gotten to the leads yet, but we can already start putting together where, where I'm kind of going with this patient. Am I going to give him that nitro, which could potentially dump his blood pressure, or is this right-sided heart failure? I don't want to do that because that's going to make matters worse. Right-sided heart failure, what does he really need? Well, what's the problem? Problem is he has no preload, so we're going to give him a preload. We're going to give him a massive fluid bolus. And that's the difference of treating right-sided versus left-sided heart failure. But now let's apply that to 12 lead EKGs. Okay, 12 leads tells you injury and location. Back, speaking of location, this is where the leads are supposed to go. If they don't look like this, you are not getting an accurate 12 lead. Okay, as far as the limb leads, uh, per our latest monitor, the Zoll X series, it is okay to put the, the, lead, the, the limb leads up here and down here if you don't have access to the limbs. The key as far as the limb leads go, as long as they're uh, symmetrical with each other. You don't want to have, uh, you know, the white lead here and the black lead down here. They have to be in the same spot, whether they're here, whether they're here, or whether they're wherever. Same with the lower limb leads. They can be here, it's fine but you can't have one here and one down there. Pretty, pretty simple. The V leads are what everyone always messes up. And again, our EMTs are trained and tested and we beat it into their heads on where these leads go. So they should know, even on the engines, uh, when they come through the H2 Academy, they do get exposed to 12 lead EKG uh, placement. I'll forget it, but the ambulance EMTs are really good with it. And as you know, V1, that's fourth intercostal space. V2, fourth intercostal space. V4, fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. V3 goes on diagonal between those two. Uh, V5, uh, anterior axillary line, fifth intercostal. V6, mid axillary line, uh, fifth intercostal. Okay? And again, that should be a review for everybody watching this. And here's just another picture of the, everything I just said. All right, moving on. The views, okay. So, as you know, when you shoot a 12 lead, it actually shoots it in two segments. It shoots the limb leads first, and then the V lead second. That's kind of why it takes a while. So you're not getting a picture of the same moment of time with, the, with each lead groupings. It's slightly delayed by about six seconds or so, okay? Whenever I read a 12 lead, I do, I have a systematic approach to it. I read every 12 lead the exact same way every single time. The first place my eyes are going to go are the inferior wall leads. That is two, three, and AVF, or lower left corner. That's where my eyes will go every single time. And if you want to think of it in visual terms, even though it's not exactly a camera, but if you were, I have this sort of graphic here of a camera kind of looking up, you are looking at the inferior portion of the heart. That's what you're capturing at that point, okay? Why is that important? Remember that right coronary artery, wrapping around. The first question as far as my treatment plan for this patient is, am I going to give him the nitro? Am I not going to give him nitro? And that's all based on right-sided versus left-sided heart failure. So, if I see elevation, in two, three, and uh, an AVF, those are my contiguous leads on the inferior side. Right there, I have to stop everything and think, well, is this right-sided heart failure? I don't know. I don't know. How do I find out? Well, I have to take a camera and put it on the right side. And that will trigger us our requirement per policy of obtaining V4R, which is this lead here, putting it on the right side, shooting a second 12 lead, if V4R is also elevated, nitroglycerin will now be contraindicated. And then you're gonna give the patient a fluid bolus because you have right-sided heart failure. But of course, you already knew that 
because the patient was hypotensive and bradycardic and had clear lung sounds. So you're already a good enough clinician to figure that out on your own, even without the 12 lead. But that's where my eyes are going to go first. Two, three, AVF. Okay, those are your inferior leads. And remember, if you're slightly new to 12 leads, when we talk about contiguous leads, what we are talking about are leads that are looking at the same geographic area of the heart. Because you can't call something a STEMI in one lead. It has to be two or more contiguous leads, which basically means two or more leads looking at the same geographic area. So two, three, AVF are contiguous inferior leads. So if you just saw it in two and nowhere else, you can't call it a STEMI. If I saw it in AVF and V6, can't call it a STEMI because those leads are not looking at the same area of the heart. It has to be two or more leads looking at the same area of the heart and that's when I can trigger this is a, indeed a STEMI alert. Understand? Great. Moving on. Okay. Next thing I look at is the lateral leads. So there's actually four lateral leads. You have uh, limb leads that are lateral leads, and then you have V leads that are precordial leads that are lateral leads. So the first two, the limb leads, are one and AVL. And again, you can kind of figure it out. You know, if you remember from paramedic school, the positive and ne negative leads when you're doing just your regular three or four leads, where's the positive and where's the negative lead in read two, lead three? Well, in lead one, the positive's here, the negative's here. Wherever the positive lead is, that's your camera. That's the direction you're looking. So if the camera's here, it's looking across this way, this is a lateral view. Okay, remember that circumflex artery? So if you saw elevation in those two leads, that's where I'd be thinking that's where the blockage is, that's where the STEMI is. Okay, your other lateral leads um, are V5, it's not on this slide here, but it's V5 and V6. And again, intuitively, if you think about these precordial leads like cameras, you can kind of figure that out. Well, what's lateral? V5 and V6 are lateral. So those are going to be my contiguous lateral leads. Now my septal leads is what you have up on the PowerPoint here, are V1 and V2. A lot of people say he has a bundle branch block, right? Okay. And a lot of people like to think that rabbit ears equal a bundle branch block, but that's not really true because there's other things that can cause the little rabbit ear uh, morphology on a, on a 12 lead. If you're really trying to figure out where the bundle, if they have a bundle branch block, what do you got to do? You have to look at the cameras that are looking at the bundle branches. And that is V1 and V2 are looking at your bundle branches. And we'll talk more about how to identify a bundle branch block left versus right in just a minute. But those are your septal leads, V1 and V2. Okay. Your anterior leads are V3 and V4. Okay. Um, and again, all V1, V2, V3, V4, if I see elevation in those contiguous leads, I'm thinking left side of the heart. But I already assumed that, right? Because I'm such a good clinician that I said, well, the patient's hypertensive, the patient is tachycardic or maybe afibish, and he's got, he's got rolls all over the place. He sounds terrible. I'm already thinking left-sided heart failure, right? Um, do I have to worry about V4R in this guy? No. He's probably so hypertensive, he really needs that nitro. I don't have to worry about it. But here, um, I'm, I'm confirming it because the elevation is all on the left side of the heart. I don't have to worry about the right side of the heart. And, and dumping his blood pressure with a shot of nitro. So once you acquire this 12 lead and you get elevation of those leads, give him nitro every three to five minutes as long as the blood pressure is above 90 per our protocols. Okay, so this is what you learn in paramedic school day one when you're trying to learn basic EKG, rate, rhythm, P waves, Peter Arundel, QRS complex, really basic, basic first grade type of stuff. The 12 lead's not that different, we're just adding two more steps. Uh, ST depression and ST elevation, right? So, as you may recall, these are all the little squiggles uh, on, the, on a regular EKG. When we're looking at the 12 lead, we're trying to find the isoelectric line. And that's this sort of baseline that all the squiggles come back to. When we're looking at 12 leads, we're really focusing on the ST segment. The ST segment starts here, sort of at the end of the S wave, and ends at the beginning of the T wave. You can also call this point right here where the ST segment starts the J point. So it is really the J point that we're looking at when we're identifying elevation or depression. If the J point is level with the isoelectric line, 
Thumbs up. That's hopefully what everybody watching this video and everyone in this room has right now. That's a healthy heart. That's a happy heart. Um, if it is uh, above, more than one millimeter above the isoelectric line, it's abnormal. If you have two or more contiguous leads that are above the isoelectric line, that's a STEMI per our protocols. Okay? But it has to be above. Okay, and this is just another uh, slide of the same thing, a little more uh, closer look at it. And again, that's what we want to see. That's what hopefully everyone in this room looks like. The ST segment right here, where I have the cursor, is what our focus is. Okay, and here's just another slide showing you the same thing. We are looking at this point right here to see if this is elevated or if this is depressed. Okay. So what does that mean? What does a STEMI mean? What does elevation mean? Elevation means injury. So if you see something like this, see, here's your isoelectric line. Here's your J point. That's like one, two, three, four, significant elevation there. And if you see that in two or more contiguous leads, that's your STEMI. But what does a STEMI mean? It means that area of the heart is being injured, not dead. And that's the difference. And that's why we focus so much on the STEMI versus other types of, uh, of cardiac function. Because if it's injured, that means I can fix it. If it's dead, it's done. So we focus on the STEMI because that's the injury phase. And I like to think of it this way. I come up to you and I start choking you. Okay? You're not very happy. But what you're not is dead yet. I am injuring you. However, if you come along and remove my hands in time, you're going to live. That's what this represents. If I, my hands stay on your neck for too long, eventually you're going to die. And then this 12 lead looks very different. So the reason we focus on this elevation, on this injury stage, is because if we in the field can identify it soon enough and get them not just to any hospital, but get them to the right hospital, the one that has a 24-7 cath lab where they can go in and catheterize that block vessel and open it up and stick a stent in there, that's like removing my hands from your throat. And that's why it's all on the clock time is muscle. But if we don't have that, if we don't acquire that 12 lead or we miss it by giving them nitro before we acquire that 12 lead, then we just take them code two to any old hospital. They sit there in the waiting room for hours and hours and hours and this whole area of their heart is dying, 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 dead. And then that's it. So sorry, hope you didn't need that area of the heart. So that's why we focus on the STEMI so much because it's something we can do something. We as a system can do something about. We can't do anything for you if the myocardium is dead. Um, it's, let me go back up again. Ischemia, on the other hand, is, is depression. So depression is not injury. It's just a blockage. Think of your angina patient or angina patient if you're from the East Coast. So you have a guy running on the, tw on the treadmill, right? And he starts having chest pain. And he said, and doctor says, oh, every time you're having chest pain, what do you take? You take your home little nitro pill, chest pain goes away. So if you had the guy hooked up to a 12 lead like you would on a stress test, and he starts feeling that pain, chances are you would see a bunch of depression in a lot of different leads because there is a blockage somewhere and the myocardial O2 demand is exceeding the amount of blood that's getting fed to it. So that will manifest itself in chest pain and on a 12 lead that will look like depression. But depression is not a STEMI. Depression is ischemia. We can take this ischemia to a regular hospital. We just take STEMIs to the STEMI center. Make sense? So ischemia, depression, STEMI, or injury is elevation. So here you have examples of all three. Um, you have what hopefully we all look like. Here the white dot represents your J point, and it's nice and level and pretty with the isoelectric line. Healthy person, that's what we hope we all look like right now. Um, here you have your classic fireman's hat um, complex looking thing. That looks terrible. That is your STEMI, if you see that. Uh, the J point is one, two, th just like th almost three boxes uh, or millimeters above the isoelectric line. If you see that in two or more contiguous leads, I'm sure your patient's quite symptomatic at that point. That's a sick person. That's the fingers on the neck. That's the guy you have to get to the STAR or STEMI center, whatever you want to call it, very, very quickly. That's your code three transport. Um, the one on the far left, or my far left, on your right, is 
ischemia, so that's your angina patient, running too hard on the treadmill, starts feeling chest pain, he'll see a bunch of depression if he had a 12 lead hooked up to him, takes his home nitro, whoop, goes back to normal. So it's remarkable just how what one shot of nitro can do to the look of a 12 lead. And again, I can't emphasize enough, do not give things like that mass 12 lead EKGs like nitro prior to getting your 12 lead. Because otherwise, it's all gonna look normal and this guy's actually having a rip in MI and it's not being recognized and he's sitting in room 24 and waiting in the ER for an hours and hours and hours and meanwhile, his myocardium is dying. And that's on us as paramedics. This is one of those things where we as paramedics make a huge difference in the patient's life. Because if you discover the STEMI over here versus over here, that is the difference between, hey, I had a heart attack 10 years ago, no big deal, I go run marathons. But that's recognizing it over here. If you recognize it over here or over here, that's the cardiac cripple. That's the guy who can't get out of bed anymore. That's the guy on the heart transplant list who has the LVAD attached to him. That's the guy who doesn't survive the night in the ICU. It's early recognition. The AHA calls it door to balloon time. So the shorter that door to balloon, balloon being the cath lab where they open up the vessel, the shorter that amount of time is, the better the patient outcome. And that is on us as the field providers. We do way more for a patient by recognizing a STEMI early and getting them not just to any hospital but to the right hospital than we ever do in our big dramatic calls and cardiac arrests and all that. Because if they, are, if they deteriorate to the point of cardiac arrest, they've already gone through all this spot and they're at the death phase. Um, so it's, it's almost too late at that point, obviously, because they're in cardiac arrest. So if you look at this sort of timeline, it's kind of interesting. So you're having the MI, okay? But what the 12 lead will look like, because remember, 12 lead is just a moment in time. Sometimes we capture them in the STEMI phase, sometimes we don't. So the patient, we always have to go back to you treat the patient, not the monitor. That never changes. So you have a patient in what we call the hyperacute phase. 12 lead's gonna look normal. You can't rule out that they're not having a STEMI by just a normal 12 lead because you may just capture it at this moment in time. So if they're symptomatic, you treat the patient and you transfer them to the hospital as appropriate. Then a little more time goes on and then you start what we call the hyperacute phase where you see big T waves. Now, big T waves, I mean lots of things can cause big T waves. The most common thing is hyperkalemia can cause big T waves. That's one of those chin scratching moments and you're like, okay, well you got big T waves. Uh, but if the patient's symptomatic, again, I'm treating the patient, not the monitor. So if you're telling me you're having chest pain, I've done my assessment, I've done my 12 lead, there's no contraindications for nitro, no contraindications for aspirin, I am going to by all means treat the chest pain and take them to the hospital. But now a little more time goes on and here you go. Here's your STEMI. Okay, that's the, the, the hand, the fingers on the throat. And now if I capture them here, well, that's a game changer now. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna do everything just like uh, treatment-wise like I always would, depending on left-sided versus right-sided heart failure. But now I'm in hurry-up mode because I know time is muscle. And the longer we wait to get that patient in the cath lab, the more that heart muscle dies. And once it's dead, it's dead forever. If you keep going, you notice you start having these weird inverted T-wave morphologies, okay? What's even more significant than that is what you see in the, this slide over here. What you notice you have here, what you didn't have here and here, are these. And these are Q waves. Q waves equal death. Q waves are dead tissue. That's the impulse going around dead tissue. That's what a Q wave represents. So the bigger the Q wave, the bigger the death, okay? Then as a little more time goes on, look at like that. The, the elevation kind of returns to normal and what the patient's left with are these pathological, we call them pathological Q waves. And so you can do a 12 lead on somebody and see nothing abnormal other than a whole bunch of Q waves. And you'll ask the patient, sir, have you ever had a heart attack before? And they'll say, oh yeah, about 10 years ago. And I was like, yeah, I see it because those Q waves will be with them for the rest of their life. Why? Because once cardiac muscle dies, it's dead forever. The more ominous thing is you have 
65 year old female, weak, dizzy, can't get out of bed, maybe a little nauseous, maybe a little vomiting, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, just kind of what we call what? Vague signs and symptoms. All right, ma'am, no problem. Now, the lazy medic will just say, all right, you wanna go to the hospital here, get in, go to the hospital, and won't do a 12 lead. That's against protocol, by the way. But as you, I'm sure, have experienced, that does happen from time to time. It's not gonna happen with you. Um, but you're going to be the good clinician and know what vague signs and symptoms look like. You're like, okay, ma'am, I'm going to do one thing before we do anything else, and I'm going to put these leads on you and take a picture of your heart. And you take that picture, and then you might see a bunch of pathological Q waves. And you say to that patient, ma'am, have you ever had a heart attack before? And she's like, oh, no. No, I've never had a heart. I've never had any heart problems. Like, yeah you have. I mean, you're not going to say that out loud, but I would not, the STEMI phase is over. I mean, she, you can't cath, you, there's nothing to save anymore. Uh, but I would still kind of direct that patient to one of our STAR centers, our cardiac centers, uh, because she had probably not in diagnosed MI. And it, luckily for her, she's still alive because it was an area of the heart that was sort of localized and she didn't need that heart or the rest of the heart is able to compensate for whatever muscle she lost. But that's what you'll see sometimes by doing the 12 lead. You'll see some remarkable things that you never expect. Um, so our focus, of course, is that STEMI phase where we can actually do something about it, where we can fix it, where we can remove those hands off the throat. And that's why we make such a big deal of it. But just keep in mind, you may be on scene, and this may be your 12 lead at 7 o'clock. You don't see anything. All right, sir, well, we'll take your change. You know, you're having chest pain, here's your aspirin, here's your nitro, oxygen, IV. Would you like to go to St. Francis? Not a problem, we'll take you to St. Francis. And in route, you're a good clinician, right? And you know that this stuff changes. That the 12 you get at 7 is going to be different if it's in a true STEMI than the one you get at 715. So what you're going to do as a good clinician is take another 12 lead. And then you take your second 12 lead and bam, you got your STEMI. Okay, Medic 60, uh, we are going to change destinations. We are going to upgrade to Code 3. We are now going to CalPAC Pacific for a STEMI activation. CalPAC Pacific is on diversion. Copy, we are going there anyway because this is a STEMI. Remember, STEMI is specialty, and we can break diversion for specialty. What we're not going to take that do, do is take that patient to St. Francis, which isn't one of our star STEMI centers. See how it works? Okay, and again, just, just visualizing what I'm talking about here in, 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 a, in a pretty picture. So here is is uh, the bottom picture is death. That's your pathological Q wave. That's like, too bad, so sad, hope you didn't need that area of your heart. The middle picture is the, what we're talking about, that STEMI phase, the injury phase that we can reperfuse, hopefully. And that upper picture there is just ischemia. It's just an area of the heart, it's not dead. Fingers aren't on the throat, it's just not getting the oxygen supply or the blood supply that it needs because of some partial blockage. Okay, the computer. Now, again, are you a good clinician? You lazy clinician. Lazy clinicians don't even bother looking at the 12 lead. What do they do? They just hit acquire, rip it off. What does the computer say it is? All right, and they just, whatever, they just blindly follow the computer. Computers are great. But the thing to remember about computer interpretation is this. You put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So, if, you, if the circumstances in which you acquired the 12 lead were not ideal, in other words, you had a lot of patient movement, which would cause artifact, or the leads were in the wrong spot, or there's a radio right next to the lead that's causing a, a wandering baseline, all these things can affect the input. The computer doesn't know that that's what's going on. The computer's just going to read whatever you whatever you put in. So you have to look at the computer interpretation kind of with a grain of salt. Yes, if it's obvious, huge STEMI, and the computer says acute MI, star, 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 with big Vegas lights around it, obviously you're going to believe the computer. But when you have one of those chin scratching moments, and I'm not sure, is it? I think so, I don't know. The computer can help you, but at the end of the day, you have to read the, the 12 lead yourself because it's not always correct. And you might see something that the computer doesn't, especially on some of these little subtle changes. Uh, the Zoll representatives who have come to train us say that their computer interpretation has been, is a lot better now than it used to be. I, I, I like to think that's true. However, I still read the 12 lead myself. And again, end of the day, what am I doing? I'm treating the patient, not the monitor.
the monitor is just confirming what I, I'm already learned by doing a good assessment on the patient. And there's actual statistics on you know, how accurate those computer interpretations are. And specificity basically means when it captures something, 98% of the time it's accurate as to what it's capturing. Sensitivity means that it actually picks up something when there's something to pick up. So if it's 52% sensitive, that means 48% of the time there was a STEMI there and it didn't see it. So you have to read it yourself, okay? Okay, again, you pull out a 12 lead and you get that, which is a perfectly normal looking happy 12 lead, right? No elevation, everything's fine, everything's beautiful. Does that, have you ruled out MI on your own? Absolutely not, because remember that timeline. You have that sort of subacute stage, then your acute stage, and then your postacute. It just depends on where you capture this patient. So 112 lead by itself does not rule out MI. Treat the patient. If they're saying they're having chest pain, we believe them. Cool. All right, and where are we gonna take them? What do these star STEMI centers have that other hospitals don't? Well, of course, they have the cath labs. There is a list of our star centers for your reference, but that's also on the destination chart. It's San Francisco General Hospital, UCSF Parnassus, I should have added, because there's two UCSF facilities now. Parnassus is the star STEMI, not Mission Bay. CPMC Pacific, Kaiser San Francisco, not South City, but Kaiser San Francisco on Geary, Divisadero, and St. Mary's. Those are your star STEMI centers. So if you have one of these and you're near Davies, if you're near St. Luke's, if you're near uh, one other, other uh, St. Saint, Saint Francis, you are not transporting to one of those hospitals. You are transporting to one of these hospitals. And if the closest one of these hospitals is on diversion, what do we do? We break diversion. Because it's their specialty, we can break diversion for a STEMI specialty. Make sense? Now, uh, something that comes up very often, we have a lot of Kaiser members in our system and they say, I want to go to Kaiser, I'm a Kaiser patient. And remember, we try to honor the patient's destination request uh, as best we can. If it's the difference of, you know, a couple miles, we will take them to Kaiser because the headaches that patient's going to go through on the back end by not going to a Kaiser hospital is not, it's going to cause them another, have another heart attack. But by all means, take them to Kaiser. But within reason, if you're on the far south east side of the city and he's having a ripping MI and he's real unstable, you know, you have to make a decision. Maybe that's not a great decision to go all the way through the city to get to Kaiser. Maybe you do go to the general with that patient. That's going to be your judgment, paramedic judgment. We are, we are, we are allowed that from time to time. All right. Uh, that's a picture of a stent that they're going to feed into uh, the catheter and open up that blocked vessel. Just some cool before and after pictures. I don't know if it's picking up on the video uh, of what a, what a coronary artery looked. That looks like a left coronary, I think, uh, that was before and right and after. Here's a pre and post cath. You can see a complete blockage right here. They catheterized it. Look at what was blocked off. Look how much of the heart was not getting its blood supply. Um, and again, whether that happens at 7 o'clock versus 7.30, is the difference of, yeah, I had a heart attack, no big deal, 10 years ago, run marathons now, versus they have an LVAD now, and they're step one of becoming Darth Vader. Okay, so let's look at some of these. All right, now, a three-year-old can look at that and say, oh, this guy is jacked. But let's, let's use our systematic uh, approach to reading 12 leads. So where did I say our eyes go to first? Our eyes always go, you should be saying it at home, the inferior leads, or the lower left corner, or two, three, and AVF. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the J point. So here's your isoelectric line, here's your J point. Okay, is it elevated here? Yeah. Is it elevated here? Yes. Is it elevated here? Are all three of these leads contiguous with each other? Yes, yes, and yes. So is this a STEMI? Yes, it is. We activate this as, as a STEMI. I'm sure this patient is quite symptomatic. But is this somebody we have to now, now the decision is not that we're going to transport them really quickly and we're going to take them to a STEMI center. Now the question is, am I going to give them nitro? Am I not going to give them nitro and give them fluids? And this is the kind of patient when you see elevation in 2, 3, and ABF where we have to take a picture of the right side. And this is where we're going to take V4, which is over here, and we're going to put it on the right side. And we're going to take a second 12 lead. 
And on the printout, we're going to put V, we're going to write in pencil or pen V4R with a big circle around it so the doctor knows that we move the lead because the computer won't pick that up. If there is elevation in V4R, nitro is contraindicated and you should give that patient fluids. Big fluid challenge. 500 cc's to start, repeat. Um, every three to five minutes and, uh, as long as their lungs are clear until you get a blood pressure of at least 90. My guess, just looking at this 12 lead, because what else do you notice about it? It's a little bradycardic. My guess is that this patient's already too hypotensive to give him nitro in the first place. So it's kind of probably most of the time on right-sided MIs a moot point. Okay? Uh, but remember, in our protocols, 90 systolic is your minimum blood pressure to give a nitro. So if this guy had a blood pressure, we'll say of 96 or 104, sort of borderline, not quite hypotensive, but just sort of right in the border, this is where we'd really have to do that V4R before we give him any nitroglycerin. Okay? Most likely, he's going to be hypotensive, and we're just going to give him a real big fluid bolus. And diesel fuel therapy, very fast, to not any hospital, but to the star STEMI center. Okay? Uh, and this is just telling you what it is. The other clue here, and again, this is basic 12 lead EKG we're talking about. I'm talking about like one inch of a mile high totem pole of information there is to know about 12 lead EKGs. We're not cardiologists. There are obviously other things to see on this 12 lead if you know a lot about 12 leads. What we're, our goals, our objectives here is just to get you the basic, basic, basic interpretation so you can identify these STEMI patients. But something to note here are reciprocal changes. So think of a seesaw. So if a seesaw is up here, it's going to be down over here. If it's going to be up here, it's going to be down over here. Well, the same thing happens on 12 lead EKG when it's a STEMI. If it's elevated here, then it's going to be depressed somewhere else. It has a mirroring effect. We call those reciprocal changes. So what do you notice about this 12 lead is kind of interesting. If I took lead two and I flipped it around and I popped it right in here, it would almost fit perfectly as if it were a piece of pie that were ripped out. Um, those are reciprocal changes. The lateral leads will be reciprocal to the inferior leads. And that's just more evidence that this is, in fact, a STEMI and not something else. So reciprocal changes can kind of help you with that. The other thing you can do, deduce, let's say you have a symptomatic patient. Um, but the 12 lead, the only abnormal thing you're seeing on the 12 lead is over here in V3 and V4 or V2, you're just seeing these kind of dips, but nothing else. And you, again, chin scratching moment. You're like, well, what's going on here? Well, can you have a posterior MI? Sure. Do we have any posterior leads? No, we don't. All we have are the reflection or the reciprocal, and we can kind of deduce, well, if it's down, that might be a reciprocal change. If you have the time, by all means, do a 24 lead EKG, put them all around. Uh, we usually don't have the time for that in the pre-hospital environment. What are we going to do? We're going to treat the patient. And if they're symptomatic, it's abnormal, you know, get on base, talk to the receiving hospital, say, hey, this is not a STEMI per se, but I have what I think might be uh, reciprocal changes to a potential posterior MI. Uh, we'd like to activate it. Are you going to be wrong sometimes? Yeah. Have you done the patient any disservice by kind of erring on the side of caution and maybe activating it? No. And either way, it's an abnormal 12 lead, and they'll figure it out at the hospital what it is. Are you going to get some snarky attitude when you activate a STEMI when it's not a STEMI? Yeah, probably. But you're just have to kind of deal with it because you're do still doing a service to the patient by taking them to a cardiac specialty hospital versus not, even if it's not an actual STEMI. But this is. This is the real deal. Okay, um, so let's look at this one. Okay, so again, where do our eyes go first? Our eyes always go to the inferior leads. So we go to 2, 3, and AVF. What do you see there? Okay, well, you see a bunch of depression is what you see. Okay, here's your isoelectric line. Here's your J point. It's like one, two, three dot, two or three boxes below the isoelectric line. Is that a STEMI? No. Is it normal? No. But remember, what, is this, what does depression indicate? Ischemia. And that's what you're looking at there. So there's a lack of blood supply to the inferior portion of the heart. Not so much that it's an MI, but it's just chin scratching moment. Can you take, in, can you take that to St. Francis? Yeah, sure. They can deal with a little ischemia. They can deal with an angina patient. But we're not through looking at this 12 lead yet. So before we make that decision, let's keep looking. The next place my eyes go to are 
the lateral leads. So that's one. How does that look? That yeah, looks all right. Okay. Uh, AVL, kind of a wandering baseline, not a clean 12 lead, but am I seeing significant elevation? Uh, a little bit, not a little, ever so slightly, but that's just one lead, and I can't call it in just one lead. What are the other lateral leads before, you say it in your head before I move my finger? That's right, they are V5 and V6. How do they look? Kind of level with the isoelectric line. Not really enough where I'm going to call this a STEMI. Okay, so, so far all I see is ischemia in the inferior leads. Okay, all right, let's keep looking, let's keep looking. V1, the septal lead. How, whoa. I mean, I'm not going to go and reach up there, but you can kind of see it. I don't know if the camera can pick up the cursor, but look at the, here's your isoelectric line. Here's your J point. Is that elevated? Yes, it is. Now, just one lead isn't good enough. I have two or more contiguous leads. So what's my other septal contiguous lead? It is V2. Okay, how does that look? Is that elevated? Here's my isoelectric line. Here's my J point. That's elevated too, so boom. There's your STEMI. Okay, patient's symptomatic. You see that? You can now activate that as a STEMI. But let's keep looking. What's left? My anterior leads. V3 and V4. How does this look? Here's my isoelectric. Here's my J point. Is that elevated? Yes, it is. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> now, I know I said that you know, V1 and V2 are septal leads. V3 and V4 are anterior leads different areas of the heart, but remember, uh, to be a contiguous means geographically right next to each other. So if you see elevation in V2, a septal lead, and V3, an anterior lead, you can still call that a STEMI because geographically they're right next to each other. You couldn't do it if it's V1 and V6 because they're not right next to each other. But anytime geographically the leads are next to each other, you can call that a STEMI. So a cardiologist would call this an anterior septal STEMI. Okay? Um, and what coronary artery would that be dealing with? What would his vital signs probably look like? Well, it's all over here. It's all on the left side, so I'm thinking left coronary artery, and that's probably where the blockage is. Probably the early stages of, uh, of a left-sided heart failure or left-sided MI is what you're seeing here. Okay? All right. How about this guy? I'm going to give you a second at home just to kind of take a look and in your head, or you want to write something down, that's fine, and, and look at what you see, and then I'll tell you what I see. 2, 3, and AVF, how does it look? Okay. 1, AVL, V5, and V6, how does that look? Meh. Okay, move to the septal leads. Remember, bundle branch blocks, where do we look? Well, what camera's looking at the bundle branches? That's V1, V2, how do they look? I'm not saying this is normal, I'm just saying is it a STEMI? And then V3 and V4, okay? your anterior leads. All right, so I'm going to tell you what I see now. Okay? And again, I'm not a cardiologist, okay? I'm just a paramedic like you, but I'll just tell you what I see and you see if you agree with me. All right? So 2, 3, and AVF. So here is my isoelectric line. Now this is not normal, I'm not saying it's a normal 12 lead, not a healthy person, but I don't think, I wouldn't call this a STEMI. Okay, the isoelectric line is actually level with the J point here. So I can't call that a STEMI. Okay, so far we can go to St. Francis or Davies. All right, moving on. V uh, lead one is level, not a STEMI. AVL, it's abnormal. Okay, it's not healthy, but is it a STEMI? No, there's really depression. There's inverted T waves. That's not quite the same as depression, but it's not, I can't really call it anything. V5 and V6 look just fine to me. Then I move on to V1. All right, well, I notice it's wide. I notice, but, but just being wide doesn't make it a STEMI. The QRS is also wide in V2. No, V3, V4. But a lot of people would look at this because they see this wide widening and kind of look at this. And it makes them think it's elevated. But if you really look at the, for the J point, it's actually level with the isoelectric line. This is not a STEMI. This is what we'd call an imposter. This is, this is basically a left bundle branch block is what you're looking at. And I know that is because I look at the leads looking at the left bundles, V1 and V2. And um, you might have learned this with the turn signals, you know, left bundle branch, right bundle branch. Um, 
uh, if you have a morphology of V1 where the QRS is, has a downward deflection, it's wide, and there's a, PR, a P uh, attached to this QRS syndrome, that's usually your first signal that it's a bundle branch block. Okay? If you had an upward deflection in V1, and everything was also the same, and it's wide, wide is your, is your sort of clue, that's going to be a right bundle branch block. Now, they're symptomatic. Do we treat it? Our protocols actually say, if you read them carefully, new onset bundle branch, left bundle branch block should go to a star receiving facility. New onset. Well, how, how the heck am I going to know if it's a new onset? I, haven't, I don't see this guy's 12 leaves for the last three years. So, again, the patient, we're going to treat him. If, it's new on, if, if the patient's symptomatic and he says, I've never heard of any bundle branchy whatever you're talking about, you're going to just assume that this is a new onset, treat the patient, and take him to one of those designated facilities, and they'll figure it out on their end. But it's not a STEMI. All right. Okay, now, obviously, this is a STEMI, right? We all can, three-year-old can look at this and tell you it's a STEMI. However, let's say you're the lazy medic and you had that patient with vague signs and symptoms, right? And you're like, I'm not going to do a 12 lead. She's just sick. She has the flu, you know? And all you did was what we used to do, which is just lead to. Look at just lead to by itself. How does it look? It looks fine. I mean, yeah, big T waves, but whatever. That just may be the lead placement. And they're like, okay, you have the flu. You want to go to the hospital? Fine, whatever. Get in the ambulance. We'll take you to the hospital. Then you do the 12 lead, and what do you see? Hello. All right, let's do our symptomatic approach. Two, three, AVF. Okay, this is depressed. This is depressed, not a STEMI. One, elevated, yes, considerably. AVL, elevated significantly. V5, significant elevation. V6, significant, your lateral leads. Okay, moving on to your septal leads. V1, a little wide, but it's okay. V2, huge elevation. V3, massive elevation. Remember, these two leads, even though this is a septal, this is anterior, these are contiguous with each other. Is this a STEMI? This is a huge STEMI. This is your widow maker. This is your whole left side of your left coronary artery blocked off. This is what this lady is going to be in V-fib within an hour um, unless you intervene. But if you never did the 12 lead and all you did was lazy medic, you would have never captured this. And that's what happens. You don't do good assessments. You think everything's BS. You don't really um, um, have a systematic approach to assessing these vague signs and symptoms patients, flu-like symptoms patients, and then it's going to be that one out of 20, one out of 50, one out of 100, where it turns out to be this, and you're going to miss it. And then they're going to be back there in an hour working a cardiac arrest. It's happened. Don't, make, don't let that person be you. All right. One last one. Again, an obvious one. The question, well, let me ask you this on this previous one and answer this for yourself at home. Let's say you did this 12 lead like you should and you see this. Patient has a blood pressure, we'll say 130 over 60 or whatever it is. This rate, which is, I don't know, 100, 300, 150, 100, about in the 70s somewhere. Um, do I need to do V4R in this patient or can I just give them the nitro? What's the answer? I'm going to give you a second answer in your head. The answer is, you don't need to do VFAR on this patient. Why? Because there's no elevation 2, 3, and AVF. Okay, if you don't see elevation there, V4R is not necessary. This is, this is obviously all involving the left side of the heart. Give her nitro until she can't take nitro anymore. As long as you have a blood pressure above 90 and there's no contraindications, such as ED drugs and so forth, or allergies. All right, one last one. On this one, do you have to do V4R? I'm going to give you a second to take a look at this, and you answer that for yourself. Hopefully you said, yes, this one I have to do V4R on. Why? Because my eyes went to 2, 3, and AVF. There's massive elevation here. And this is a classic right-sided MI is what you're looking at. And before I even touch the nitro, I have to move V4R, take a second 12 lead to confirm that this is a right-sided MI. Nitro is contraindicated. You might want to have this guy call his family, too, and tell him he loves him, because this is a nasty-looking 12 lead. Um, 
think you kind of... Now, you can go online yourself, and then we can keep looking at all these and look at different types of 12 leads. There's tons of resource material out there on 12 lead EKG, on pre-hospital 12 lead EKG interpretation beyond this little video that I presented for you. So there's a lot of education you can do on your own. The expectation is when you get here that you know this, that you can take our final exam, which I'll just let you know right now is 12 lead, 12 lead heavy, and there will be a lot of questions where I'll just give you a 12 lead and a bunch of vital signs and I'm asking you, is this right-sided heart failure, left-sided heart failure? Is this right coronary artery, left? Do you have to do V4R or do you not have to do V4R and so forth? So be prepared for that when you come in here. All right. Now we're going to move on. Uh, I'm just going to talk very quickly about LVADs, left ventricular assist device. Um, I have a picture of one up here. This is something we're going to start running into more and more. Some of you may have already run into it. Uh, it's becoming the standard of care for late stage heart failure. So these are the patients who didn't go to the STEMI center. So these are the patients that uh, the, pa the paramedic didn't do a 12 lead on. And they just took them to whatever hospital or signed them out AMA. And now they have a whole section of their heart that's not working anymore. And they're basically on the heart transplant list. And before we had LVADs, when you're on the heart transplant list, you, you just hope your number came up before your heart just gave way. There was no other option. Now they have a bridge device, and that's really what this is. It's a bridging device between the time it takes while you're waiting for a heart, someone to die and have a compatible heart. Um, they have these LVADs. And they're interesting machines where they kind of take over the work of your left ventricle. Um, but because they do and the way they operate, um, there's some unique things to consider, especially if you have a patient in cardiac arrest that has an LVAD patient. The first thing to remember is they're battery operated. So the patient will wear these little holster-like devices. Those are the batteries. Um, so you might get called out, not for cardiac arrest, but his batteries are dying. I mean, I don't know about you, but I get nervous when my iPhone gets down to 10%. I can't imagine what an LVAD patient you know, is thinking about when you know, he's down to... Uh, um, one bar. Um, they usually have like plug-in devices at home or some rechargeable device at home where they can switch them out, but we have had cases where those have failed. Uh, so that might be what you're dealing with, is just like maintaining battery life. Um, we have designated LVAD receiving centers in San Francisco. There's only two of them. An LVAD patient must be transported, no matter what, to one of these facilities, and that is California Pacific Medical Center, CalPAC Pacific, not to be confused with the other CalPACs, and UCSF Parnassus. That's it. They must be transported unless they have some sort of other criteria like trauma or burns or something like that. But otherwise, LVAD patients, no matter what, will go to one of those hospitals. And usually, it's a battery, it's a power issue that's what's going on. The other thing to note when you are assessing them is the way these are constructed are they basically are connected directly to your left ventricle. And it's kind of like a, a, a bilge pump. They're constantly running. And you can actually take your stethoscope and put it over uh, their chest, and you'll hear the motor running. And that's a good way to assess whether the LVAD is functioning properly. When you hook them up to the EKG, they still will have PQ and uh, QRSs. They could still go into VFib, VTAC. You would shock them in cardiac arrest, just like you would in any a other ACLS situation. The interesting thing, however, is because the motor is keeping a constant pressure, it's maintaining a constant versus our hearts where the pressure changes, which is what we feel on a pulse is the different the pressure changes. On an LVAD patient, they will have no pulse. They'll be talking to you, and they will have no pulse whatsoever. The other thing to remember about an LVAD patient, if you do have a cardiac arrest situation, we do not want to do chest compressions which is counterintuitive. Why would I not do chest compressions? Well, because the LVAD, the way it's constructed, it is built directly connected to the heart and to the left ventricle. And if you push too hard in that thing, you'll actually lacerate the heart. So that's bad. So it basically becomes a chemical code. You're going to do everything except chest compressions on an LVAD cardiac arrest. And then you're thinking to yourself, well, no chest compression, just drugs and airway stuff. I can't feel a pulse whether they're alive or not. How do I know if I have return of spontaneous circulation on an LVAD? Well, think about it. What, um, what treatment do you have or what ass assessment tool do you have on your monitors that's a very, very accurate indicator of perfusion? 
Hopefully what you're saying at home is you're in tidal CO2. Exactly. So you can't have high in tidal CO2s in the 20s, 30s, 40s if you don't have perfusion. And that on an LVAD patient is going to be your measure of success, whether you have a pulse or don't have a pulse, is if you have in titles above 20. Um, and that's also per AHA. An in title above 20 per AHA is actually defined the definition of ROSC, even if you can't feel a pulse. All right. Uh, so it's just something to note about LVADs. Uh, they're not that common right now, but we do have a few patients in the city right now who have them. Uh, I've been told that they will eventually become as common as dialysis. So it's something we're going to see more and more and more of. The takeaway with LVADs is follow the family's instructions. Make sure you understand uh, they probably know more about LVADs than you do. Um, and if they say they have to go to UCSF, they do have to go to UCSF. Um, and then if you have a doing your assessment, remember they will not have no pulse whatsoever, but that's okay. Listen to the motor to see if the motor's running. It'll sound like a bilge pump. Um, and if you do have an arrest, no CPR. But you do do everything else, including defibrillation, drugs, airway, et cetera. Okay? All right, and this is just another, uh, just to kind of hit it home, make sure you know this. These are our star STEMI receiving centers. SC, uh, San Francisco General, UCSF Parnassus, St. Mary's, CPMC Pacific, and Kaiser on Geary. And let's take a quick bathroom break, and we'll be right back.